My life started somewhere in another continent called Africa. Um, when I was three years old, uh, a war broke out in my country. I was born in central Somalia, and everything was fine. We are a middle class family in then nine, late 1980s Somalia, and civil war broke out, and horrible things are happening. So my family fled. So what happened usually is that wealthy, bigger folks just fly out of the country, and then other folks get around with the car. So our car ran out of the, out of the gas, so we started walking and running by foot from one country to another. So we, for days, so you walk all day, scorching sun, and at night you just crash, and then the next day you pick up and leave. And that, that was, we walked for days. And in this process, I remember, I was a three-year-old, and in Africa there's no stroller, so my mom and uncles were carrying me in their bag. So, and in the Kenya-Somalia border, as families and different communities kind of just fled in one direction to the safer place, um, every night when we crash and get up and leave, you know, sometimes like all the porks, you know, people that haven't drink water for a day, they're dead bodies that you kind of walk through it. And then when we made it safer to the border, uh, the UN agencies came in and they set up a refugee camp. So, and my earliest memory was that, that you know, being three year old and you're just kind of carefree and you just want to run around, but the whole environment is controlled. And there isn't anything in place, so there's no infrastructure, water, running water, and all that. So we have to make things as we have to cope with the survival situation. So my folks set up a makeshift tent. So we live in a tent uh, made of kind of trees and cloth and all that. So I'm seven, I'm the middle child of the seven kids in my family. Um, so we lived in that situation for a while, but there was a hope. So what happens is that there's a UN lottery program where everybody applies for and then one person picked up to get settled in America and Canada and all those places. And the hope there is that everybody wants to come to America. This is the, the land of the honey and bees and milk and everything and money. And there's all that, and there's also this impression that America is just the best Western country to go to. So you hear sometimes, that family got lucky, where are they going? Canada. But over there, there's ice, and as refugees in camp, the snow that we hear about is like, our assumption is like the ice we use in the water. We're like, we don't want to go there, we, because the place is very sunny. And I spent my entire boyhood, so one thing that we do is that, you know, when we are not in a tent and waiting for our food from the UN agencies to give out. It's a very controlled environment. As little boys, we kind of just get trash together, get some strings, and we make soccer balls. And we play soccer for like seven hours straight sometimes. And uh, there's no school. So that's how we pass time. Um, and then the hope is that sometimes after you apply, there's this wall, bulletin board, where families that get picked up get posted. So every day we get up and just go and go, go to that bulletin ball that is it posted. And fortunately, in 1997, my mom's name, my mom name got posted, and she's coming to America. So that's the happiest moment in, in our account. And we're not coming with her. The bad news is. So mom came to America by herself, and she got settled in in Stone Mountain, Georgia. And the great thing is that. Once a refugee gets here, they get to petition for their family to be for family unification, and she immediately, you know, petitioned for her children, and our life got better. Mom started; she didn't work, speak a word of English, but she started working at this warehouse in Atlanta, and she started sending for us $150, you know, a month. Our life got better. We moved out of refugee camp to Nairobi, and we have hoped that we come into America. So in Nairobi, we watch TV. TV, American TV show that, you know, there's this big TV in the whole community come and watches everybody that's coming to America. And some of the movie, movies we watch is like the Texas Ranger and Steve Segal and, and that kept us going. And also in Nairobi there's this uh, bulletin that if your family sent visa for you, you go every day. So that's the hope. Um, every day we go there, look for our name, it wasn't posted, we go back constantly. And finally, one time it got posted. All of a sudden we come to America, so it got so happy that we were just crying and celebrating for hours, me and my siblings. 
And the next time is that this is mid 90s and cell phone wasn't this prevalent. So this this landline that we have to go line up every week to talk to mom, to call mom every week or every Sunday. So that day, that Sunday came around, we ended up talking to mom for like hours, just like we felt like we were with her. We kept waiting and in this process of waiting, there's so many processes you go through. So there's cultural orientation, there's health, that screening and all this as you come, but you just wanna just leave and come to America. Do you have this big impression? That's the dream, that's the hopes that give you mo going. So every day our, our job was just get up, go to that bulletin board, was it posted? And, and the cool thing is some of your neighbors who are refugees, they never get posted, but they go to Sweden and you hear things about, it. in Sweden they, they don't get sand sometimes. You're like, yeah, I don't wanna go to, we're glad we're going to America. and. Once our name got posted, I remember staying up all night because we were all happy for coming to America. And I remember when we boarded the airplane from Nairobi, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, to Brussels in refugee camp. And in Kenya, all we used to eat is corns and like rice and like goat meat and stuff. Uh, the first food they gave us was a burger. And there's this bread and chicken and there's lettuce, you know, the green stuff. And we're taking it apart and showing to each other. Like this is, like seriously, this letter? So that was like very fascinating to us. And my, our entry point to America was uh, New York airport. And from there, there was these bags that they give you. That's you coming to America. So they're very, it kind of, it's, even if I, as we welcome like some refugees now, I look for that bag. So this bag has your number, your document in it. The IOM, the International Organization for Migration has it. And, and there's still that uncertainty of being refugee. You connected that you, my paper might not be right. So out of New York, at, we flew from New York to Atlanta to re, get reunited with my mom, and it was the happiest moment of my life because I lived with, I grew up as a refugee with you know absence of my mother. Uh, and then in Atlanta, we got settled. And I remember our first address is coming from the airport all the way to east side of Atlanta in Clarkston, Georgia. Uh, it was 751 North Indian Creek Drive, and we walked into this apartment, uh, and there was a carpet on the floor, uh, and that was good for enough for us because, like in Nairobi, everything was concrete, and our previous life we used to live in tent, uh, but in the room has beds. It was well set up, and the life in America starts the next day. So here's the very first space, the school system, and we got enrolled in school. So I, I enrolled in school, I found one thing difficult, which is I really want to express myself. Uh, I'm very like a person who has empathy. I develop a lot of empathy during my refugee boyhood. So I want to express myself and understand people, and people understand me, but I didn't, speak, I didn't have enough English vocabulary. So uh, in, even in school, I want to interact with other kids, but you just came and you don't know enough English. Though this is a program called ESL, so you're a little bit isolated. English as second language you're taught the basics. So one thing I did was, every day, five in the morning, I get up and there's this show called Saved by the Bell. So, and the setup is just like the school. So every morning I get up and I just watch Saved by the Bell and my favorite character was Screech. And, <laughs> and my favorite episode was when, one day when Screech hurt his uh, leg and his buddies, Mario Lopez and other characters were trying to make fun of him. So they're trying to say that all of them fall down. So just know that karma is a bitch in life. So, uh, so I just watched that show and learned a lot of English from it. And that complemented my ESL English at, 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 uh, at school. And that's kind of my entry point into America. And a few years into that, my senior of high school of college in 2006, uh, my family keeps hearing about Tennessee is good, Nashville is good, there's a lot of jobs. Dell computers are hiring a lot of, a lot of people and, they, and then also the job traffic and the job is not as bad as Atlanta. So the, the story, our story to Tennessee is the story of uh, every immigrant story that is we came here for economic prosperity to find jobs. So we packed, we had 1989 Toyota Corolla, silver one. And we packed a U-Haul and moved here with my mom's siblings and uncle. And the first week, everybody, all the adults in my family got a job at Dell Computers, packing boxes. And I was this high school senior, 18-year-old, turning 19, and I just wanted to work and help my mom. And 
so I didn't have that network. It's Nashville, a very new. I didn't make friends yet, and I just started looking for a job. I landed a job on West End Pizza Hut on West End Avenue, washing dishes every night. And I just keep doing that. And I'm like, I cannot keep doing that. So everybody keeps hearing that in my community, education is the way out of all this stuff. You can really help your mom and do well in life. So I started taking classes at Nashville State Community College. And I'm like, I want to go to university. I tell a friend of mine, and he told me, I went to university here. Life is very hard in America. But if you want to do it, get a security job. So in security job, you patrol and you just do things, and you can also study while you're on the job some days on weekends. So I got me a, a security job and enrolled at a transfer from Nashville State to Tennessee State University. And one of the building where I'm security guard, there was this, this organization called Tennessee, Refug Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Right Collusion. So my job is to patrol the building, make sure the cars are not broken into. But there's some immigrant folks that come out of here. I'm highly curious pe person. So one day I woke up to them like, what do you guys do here? And, and they told me that we empower immigrants, we help people educate about their right and responsibility. I'm like, so every day when I do my patrol on my breaks, I go hang out with them. And for a 19-year-old, that's a dream. Some days say they have pizza and grapes and stuff. So I go there, eat that food, hang out with them. And, and everything they talk about resonates with me. So I'm going to school and I start volunteering for them. I start volunteering, showing up more. And, and that kind of is, is a point that in America, if you get up every day and just show up, even in life, if you get up every day and show up sometimes, uh, you kind of find opportunity. So I went through this college and working security job and volunteering for them. Right after college, I had so many jobs while in college. So I worked for health department as an outreach coordinator. Uh, th because I speak like three different languages and they really find me valuable. But I wanted to kind of like express myself, advocate for whatever that Turk was trying to do. So when I graduated from college, they launched this program that called Welcome in Tennessee Coordinator. So they hired me for a job and then I didn't know a lot to do with it. So my job became going to Memphis and talking to Rotary Club and Chamber of Commerce is about welcoming immigrants and Tennessee being a welcoming place and warm place for all and it was one of the greatest jobs I had and and also during that job it, it means a lot of driving and across in the back row of the country some days some, sometimes we go to Colombia and other places I figured it out that the nicest place people just live here in, in Tennessee and in Nashville uh, people are warm people are very hospitable in, on the individ individual level and a few years working that, that job, being Welcome to Tennessee director, opened my eyes a lot. And I transitioned out of that and started a consulting company. And I still do what I, um, I do. I used to do at Turk, but just on a voluntary level. I sit on board of directors that organize those similar organizations that empowered me and gave me voice uh, just to give back. And most importantly, I'm a big believer in like kind of participating in life, in the, the civic culture, the life of your city, the life of the, your community. So in 2011, I found a letter in my, inbox, in my mail, and Mayor Carl Dean sent to me asking me to be on, on his advisory board. So here I am, a decade less, a refugee boy from Somalia, and the mayor of Nashville is asking you just to, to be part of his advisor. So it was just, just a moment for me that showed that, affirmed that, in this community or this country or this city that if I get up every day and work hard and show up that America is the best place in the world the way this opportunity is. So that's kind of my story and it's still continuing but thank you so much for, for listening to me. <laughs>